My wife and I kind of have a, a joke uh, that we shared with some. We feel like professional waiters ourselves. Uh, well, it's been our experience that many times when God promises something in our hearts and in our lives, it usually comes with a season of waiting, oftentimes many years, actually. As a matter of fact, I was planning to preach something entirely different this morning, but the Holy Spirit has redirected me for today, and we're going to continue on this theme of waiting. God has been putting it in my heart and saying, no, I'm, I'm not done with the church yet, uh, so there, there's another message on, on waiting. And some of you might be thinking, wow, I can't wait till Pastor Dan is done with this message because I already heard one last week, but it's okay. The Holy Spirit wants to continue to work in our hearts. He has literally put together a mini-series for us these last two weeks that I am encouraged about how he's going to speak to you. And so uh, the message title is very simple. It's still waiting. <laughs> Please stand with me for the reading of God's word this morning from Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to be reading this passage from the New American Standard uh, Bible beginning in verse 27, you'll see it behind me as well. Why do you say, O Jacob, and you assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives strength to the weary, and to the one who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not be weary. Let's pray together and ask the Lord, Holy Spirit, we pray. Have your way in these words this morning. We pray that each and every heart would be fertile ground for what you desire to say, oh God. And Lord, I commit even myself to you in communicating it this morning, that you would be glorified and do the work you desire to. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Now, depending on what version of the Bible you were following along that passage in, if you weren't on the screen with us, the promise of renewed strength in the seasons of our waiting, it prevails in each and every translation. Your version may address those who wait for the Lord, as I read, or those who hope in the Lord, or those who trust in the Lord. Some versions even say those who look for the Lord will gain new strength. It's all one and the same. Expectantly and actively waiting for the Lord is looking for him. Trusting for the Lord is what produces great hope in the Lord during our times of waiting because we can be confident that in those seasons, he always has our best in mind. He is a good God. And at the end of the day, what it's all about is trusting in the Lord. As a matter of fact, waiting on the Lord is necessary to produce the life of faith in our hearts that God desires of us. He calls us to these seasons of waiting so that we can focus on him more, that we could seek him more, that we could press into him more, that we can allow his Holy Spirit to saturate our hearts even more, filling us, preparing us, strengthening us before he is finished with us waiting. See, just like fruit requires time to ripen, our hearts need to be ready for what Jesus has for us. And you know what, church? That is the main thing. The main thing that God is concerned about in our seasons of waiting is our heart. 
the main thing that Jesus is pursuing and preparing is our heart and our seasons of waiting. Everything else flows out of that. The answer to prayer, the specific ways things take place, the things you're trusting God for, however they shape out, the main thing Jesus working on is our hearts. See, we must have the courage to cooperate with the Holy Spirit during these seasons. If we want to experience what God desires to do in our hearts, in our seasons of waiting, that we cooperate with the molding that the Holy Spirit is doing during these times. Listen, I'm not talking about molding like you're feeling so, you've been waiting so long that God has put you up on a shelf and therefore all kinds of funky stuff is growing out of you. But it's not the kind of molding that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Lord shaping and strengthening our character. I'm talking about the Lord working in our spirits and our souls deep within when we experience these seasons of waiting because if we're honest those are the only times our hearts are that open to the Lord working that deeply so we grow to a place of being ready to receive what God has promised think of it this way and I want to share some uh, a quote from a retired minister that I respect very much um, anytime we had ministers gatherings for our state he would he would multiple times he would say something like this you don't want what Jesus has for you before it's time because it will crush you if you're not ready for it think about that for a second put it another way the right thing at the wrong time is just as good as the wrong thing. It's all about God's timing. He's developing our hearts in our seasons of waiting. And we think about the scripture. The Bible is replete throughout all of scripture of finding people in seasons of waiting. In Genesis, Abraham waited for the fulfillment of God's promise. In Exodus, Moses is waiting for God's appointed time to return back to lead Israel, who's waiting for their deliverance. In Leviticus, the priests are prescribed, the temple practices, but ultimately, it's waiting and fulfillment on the great high priest, Jesus. In Joshua, the nation of Israel is going to inherit the promised land, but they're actively waiting, fighting for the promise in battle. In Judges, highlights the desperate need for a godly ruler that the people are waiting upon. Ruth is found waiting for the provision of God with her only possession being her faith in him and her mother-in-law. In the books of Samuel and Kings, the Jews anxiously awaited a righteous king that would find its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And even when King David is anointed, it's still not time for him to step into his role. He has to wait until God's appointed time to reign. Ezra and Nehemiah are also found waiting for the restoration of Jerusalem, its walls and its temple, as God had promised post-exile. Esther waits for Jehovah to intervene while she lays her own life on the line on behalf of her family and her nation. Job waits upon God's healing for restoration through utter tragedy. Isaiah's prophecies sat in wait on their fulfillment of Christ. Jeremiah predicted the restoration of Jerusalem after 70 years of, you guessed it, waiting in exile. Ezekiel and Daniel's prophecies are still in wait, pointing to the end time salvation of Israel. Hosea reveals the heart of God, which is that he's willing to wait for people to recognize who he is, even while they go about their sin. Joel predicted the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would ultimately take hundreds of years to be fulfilled, and we're still experiencing it today. Jonah awaited deliverance.
deliverance from the belly of the whale while he was temporarily stuck so he could fulfill God's promises for his life. Zechariah predicted a day when God will be king of all the earth. This time has not yet come. Church, should we keep going because that's just Old Testament? Just part of the Old Testament. And then in the scripture comes 400 years of waiting between our Old and New Testaments. It's a period that is referred to as, as at the voiceless time of God. It wasn't that God wasn't working, but we don't have any inspired messages from the Lord in that intertestamental period that are recorded which means for that 400 year period of time, all of humanity was waiting for an inspired word from God. And even more than that, waiting for the Christ to be revealed and come to earth for the first time. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record the events of Jesus. They reveal the Christ whose kingdom had come and yet is to come. Jesus himself is found waiting in the desert for God's deliverance from the evil one and waiting in the tomb for his bodily resurrection. The believers in Acts are instructed to wait on the Holy Spirit in the upper room that birthed the New Testament church, which you and I are a part of today. Amen? Listen, in the books of Thessalonians, the believers under trial, they are reminded that they're awaiting a blessed hope, a future time of rapture and resurrection. In the letters addressed to Timothy, Paul is waiting on a young leader to step up into his place of leadership in the church that God had called him to. And we find even in the books of Peter's epistles addressed to believers enduring persecution that a time will come when the heavens and earth will be made new. A theme which is carried through John's revelation reminds us of that, that all will be one day as God intended it was in Eden and even better for all of eternity. But for now, you and I, church, the believer in Christ, are implored to be faithful Faithful to him until that day comes, waiting for the fulfillment of this glorious promise. You see, the truth is, nearly every book in the Bible has someone who's waiting on God for something. So, do you think it might be true this morning? that your waiting is not unique? Do you think it might be true that our God indeed is a God who works in the waiting even if it's not visible, uh, visible as we would like it to be? He's working in your waiting. He's working in your waiting. If he can work in the waiting of the saints of old, if he could work in the waiting of the stories that we have from Scripture, if he can work in waiting a testimonies like we heard last week, for example, and like some of you have, if God can work in the waiting of others, I want you to know, church, God can work in your waiting too because the Holy Spirit has spoken to my heart and he said there's some who are going to hear this message that they've gone from waiting to despair. They've gone from hope to hopelessness. They've gone from faith, and they're not even sure their faith is real anymore. Some of you this morning, here or online, if you're really honest, that's the place you're in with respect to your waiting right now. But I want you to know that Jesus is there, that he sees you, that he is with you, that he never leaves or forsakes you. I know you don't feel it, but God will come through. He will meet you in your waiting. And the most important thing is allowing him 
to work in your heart and in your mind and in your life because when he does answer that prayer, then you will know without a doubt that it is him and him alone who has done these things and then you can be a messenger of encouragement to someone else in their waiting just like the people in the Bible have become messengers to us through their seasons of waiting. God wants to use you. But don't give up hope. Don't give in to despair or discouragement. Don't give in to fear. Don't throw the towel in. Don't, it's okay to question God, but don't question your faith in God. It's okay to question why your circumstances are the way they are, but it's not okay to question the character and heart of God because it says that he always has good in store for us. He's working and you're waiting too. Now, this is not just about good things come to those who wait. Maybe there's somewhat of a truth to that. Honestly, that's not even a biblical statement. <laughs> it's not found in the Bible. But also waiting on God is not necessarily passive. It's, it's not the same thing per se, as just waiting to board an aircraft or uh, just waiting for your spouse when they're shopping. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it, it's, it's not passive. It's waiting on God is not just waiting around. That's not the biblical example of waiting. It's active. We don't rely on our wisdom alone. We rely on the Holy Spirit who knows all things in advance. Waiting on God is active, which means that there's an expectation. Actually, the original language of the word wait, to wait on the Lord, waiting on God, underneath that language is, is, a, is a heart of expectation. It's, it's not that it's just that I'm waiting for God, I'm waiting around for God. It's I'm waiting for God to move because I know he can. There's, a, there's an expectation. So because of that, Here's some of the things that we actually can do in our waiting. If you will, these are the WMDs that you can use in your seasons of waiting. Pastor Matt talked about it a little bit already in a few moments ago. The first and foremost is worship. God is worthy of our praise because of who he is but this helps us as well. We just talked about it even when we don't feel like it and we, just, and, and we make the decision, we, we choose to worship. All the butterflies and emotions might not be there every single time that we do. I would argue with you that God is working more in your heart when you choose to worship when there are no feelings than when you just love the feelings. God is working deep in your soul when you make that choice to be a worshiper and it benefits you and I. It benefits us because worship opens the door to his presence and his peace in our hearts while we wait. And for some of us, that might be all God gives us for the moment. But he is sufficient. And his presence is enough. Worship is also a weapon as well. Because sometimes our waiting is like a battle. Sometimes our waiting is a spiritual battle because we're praying something through or for someone to know Jesus or over a difficult situation. And sometimes our waiting is like war as well. And again, that's why we activate the gift of worship that Jesus has given us, worship being the only thing we can give back to God that he doesn't already own. He made us, he created us. The scripture says all the earth belongs to the Lord. 
the only thing that God doesn't own is the worship we give him until we give it to him. We have to choose to give it to him. We have to express our love for him, our, our gratitude, our faith. Sometimes in worship, we're confessing the word of God over our lives and over our situations because the truth is when we finally come to the end of ourselves and all our analysis and all our striving and we finally come to that moment of surrender and laying whatever it is down before Jesus, Jesus in our season of waiting, that is the time that Jesus will come and he will do amazing things. When we finally say, Lord, I don't understand. Why is this taking so, so long? Jesus, I don't get it. You made this promise, but you know what? I'm going to worship you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to be faithful what you call me to do right now, even if I don't like right, my right now, but I'm going to give it all to you you, God. And if nothing ever changes, you are worthy of the worship and the praise and the glory of the honor because I know that this life is not my home anyway, that I'm going to be with you for all of eternity and, the, and this life is a vapor. So Jesus, I'm going to worship and I'm going to worshipfully, worshipfully lay that thing down. And when we finally get to that place, I'm telling you, I have experienced this. God moves rapidly. Why? Because it's about our hearts, church. It's about what God is doing within our souls. It's about what he's doing inside of us. That not even if you're married, not even your spouse knows you that intimately as the Lord does. And so he allows those seasons to bring us to that place because we connect with Jesus in spirit and he does amazing things. This reminds me of uh, some of you may have heard this song. It's a little dated now, but there's an interesting story behind it. There was a, st a song by a Christian artist, uh, John Waller, that was called While I'm Waiting. Those of you who know it, it's probably because you saw the movie it was attached to, uh, which was a movie called uh, Fireproof with Kirk Cameron. Now, that was a little while ago, but here's what's important to know. At that time, God had put a dream inside John's heart. Uh, he was a worship pastor, uh, but God had put a dream inside his heart uh, that, that he was going to launch him into mainstream Christian music, that he was going to give him the gift of writing his own lyrics and that, you know, thousands of people were going to benefit from that gift. And John had that dream in his heart for 17 years. 17 years he had had that dream in his heart. And he actually wrote that song while I'm waiting to express his feelings and also demonstrate his faith because he had come to that place where he said, God, I don't get it. You made this promise. I can't see it, but I'm gonna worship while I'm waiting. That's literally why he wrote that song. And some of the lyrics prove that. It says, I will worship while I'm waiting. I will serve you while I'm waiting. The biggest one being, I will trust you while I'm waiting. And you know what? It'd be just like God, as was the case. The moment that God brought John to that place and he cooperated with the Holy Spirit to the, get to that place of saying, Jesus, I know what you promised. I know I'm not cuckoo. I, I know that I didn't, you know, hear voices. No, I know I heard from the Holy Spirit. I know you made a promise, but it's been 17 years. So I'm laying it down. Let your will be done. God gives them that song. That song gets used in the movie Fireproof. 
As a result, John is launched into his purpose through the very song. God opens the doors for thousands, like you and I, some of uh, us have heard that song, to be encouraged, to be strengthened by that song. He was launched into his dream after 17 years of waiting when he chose to lay it down before the Lord in worship and exalt him anyway. Church, our God is a God who works in the waiting. That's why we worship. Next, we need to maintain. I know that sounds very exciting, doesn't it? But we need to maintain our positions while we're waiting. We need to just keep faithfully doing what Jesus has called us to do until he says otherwise. We persevere. We don't give up on God. We don't quit. We don't give up hope while we're waiting. And we certainly do not need to panic because we know that no matter what, God is still in control of our lives and of what's happening in the world. There is hope in expectantly waiting on God. It's this hope that fuels our faith and this hope that gives us the very strength to persevere. So we maintain, we stay faithful, we follow Jesus in the small things while we're waiting. So with our hearts full of worship, maintaining this position of expectancy, we also need to be discerning. As we grow in the Lord personally, we grow in our ability to hear the Spirit's voice and to be discerning people. Sometimes I say, sometimes what we need to do in our waiting, because our waiting is active in nature, is go check some doorknobs. What do I mean by that? If you're praying for an open door, then go see if the door's open. Don't just wait around. Go check, spiritually speaking, go check the handle. Is it locked? Is the door cracked open? Is it wide open? Is it bolted shut? The more we go closer to Jesus, the more we're able to observe what he's doing through our circumstances. And there will still be times, nevertheless, that things might remain unclear for a season, and that's okay. We worship we maintain our faithfulness to Jesus. We worship, we maintain our faithfulness to serving the purposes of his kingdom and serving others. And remember that the spirit will never lead us in contradiction to the word, never. That's why this is so vital to know the scripture for ourselves. Because if the Holy Spirit, you believe, is saying something to you that does not line up here, guess what? It's not a Holy Spirit you're hearing from. We need to know what the scripture says for ourselves. God frequently, and I would say most of the time, encourages us and directs us in our waiting through the promises already contained in his word. And if they're in your heart already, during those seasons of waiting, he will bring them to light exactly when you need them. And one of my all-time favorites is Romans 8.28. From the NIV, which promises, we know in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Do you know what the word all means in the original Greek language? All. Everything. Everything. God works in all things. This does not mean that all things we experience in our waiting are good. It is not saying that. This does not mean that all things we experience in our waiting are bad or that God desires bad things to happen for some reason. 
None of this means that. What this means is that God re-engineers and he redeems everything for our good if we are in Christ and maintaining faithfulness to him, maintaining a heart full of worship, faithfulness to Jesus, being discerning. When we're discerning, when we know the word, when we're worshiping and when we're faithful, then we can sense that God is doing something. Then we can understand understand and begin to see, oh, I think Jesus is up to something here. I think something's about to change. I can smell it in the air. I see, I see it. I see, I don't see it right here, but I could see it. I see that something's about to shift because God is getting ready to move. Listen, if you want to be that kind of follower of Jesus, then be in his word, then worship him when you don't feel like it. Maintain faithfulness to Jesus no matter what. And then you will be that kind of follower of Christ that you can look up and say, I look up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And while waiting on God is active in nature, we do need to exercise some caution. And that caution is sometimes when we're waiting too long and we get uncomfortable, listen, I've been there too. We begin to overanalyze and take matters into our own hands. Jesus, I'll figure this out. Bless my plans, Lord, I'll take care of this. Sometimes we do that, it's in our human nature. But when God has us in those seasons where things are unclear, those are the times when we literally wait. We could still worship, we still maintain, we still discern, but other than that, we wait. We don't make any big decisions. We don't make any rash decisions. We don't stop praying because it's not working. Nope, those are the seasons. We just wait knowing with confidence that what God desires for us will ultimately be better than what we could have ever put together or imagined for ourselves. In those times, we still have expectancy. We still have hope, believing God, looking forward to the fulfillment of his promises over us. Now it's 4th of July weekend. Many of you may have plans for this summer. You're looking forward to them, right? There's hope, there's expectancy, there's something good or something fun coming. Maybe you're gonna see a family member you haven't seen in a while. Maybe you don't wanna see them, but you're going anyway. You know, whatever the case is, you, you, have, you may have a trip this summer that you're looking forward to. You have, you have hope, you have expectation. You see, in the spiritual things, just like Isaiah said, that we would rise up with wings on eagles when we wait on the Lord. That eagle soars to its great heights using power that God has harnessed through the earth. That eagle soars to its heights by rising thermal currents, rising from the surface of the earth. And the eagle is strong enough to get into those currents. Most other birds can't survive that kind of turbulence, but it is the eagle that actually thrives on that and lays into it so that it is literally nearly effortlessly carried up into the sky. You see, we must abandon trust in ourselves, church, in order for us to, spit, to soar to spiritual heights in the Lord that we could have not achieved on our own energy, our own strength, but by His grace. And when we fully trust God when we're waiting, even when and especially when there are great storms in our lives, I'm telling you, church, that is the moment for a miracle. I'm not saying it's going to happen in an instant. I'm saying in a kairos moment, in God's, not chronos, not logical time, but God's appointed time. 
It's a moment for a miracle when you're willing to abandon trust in yourself and throw yourself into the arms of Jesus and rise in the spirit with him. When God finally gets that from you and I in our hearts, I'm telling you that's when you're gonna see amazing things. So let's stand, let's practice this, and let's worship together, making this song a declaration in our hearts this morning. Praise you, Jesus. This is a house of worship. And this is a place of freedom. Where every demon trembles. And where we proclaim. Our hearts are full of faith as they are, and you have our full attention. You have the final say. Say, come along. So come along. Every day. 
of David the psalmist are coming to mind right now. Some of you need to sing this song to yourself. Now, I'm not saying worship yourself. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me. That's a different religion. Tax exempt too. But anyway, I'm not saying worship yourself. What I'm saying is like David said, why are you so downcast, my soul? Put your hope in God, the maker of heaven and earth. So we're gonna sing this again, and we're gonna do two things. For those of you that need to hear that, be encouraged to sing it out over how you feel, over yourself to the Lord. Secondly, I feel in my heart that there are some that you just need to lay that burden down. That's where you're at right now. You just need to come to the feet of Jesus, whether you desire to do that here at these altars or make your seat an altar wherever you are. I'm not concerned about the place. God is concerned about the response of our hearts. So these two things, sing it over yourself if you need to. Sing it to your own spirit if you need to. And if you need, if you need to physically lay something at the feet of Jesus that you've been waiting on and it just feels like too long and you're giving up hope or you don't know what to do next, let's respond to the Holy Spirit and lay it down before him in worship as we continue to sing together. In the name of Jesus, this is our miracle. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. in the house today that God wants to bring about some healing so if you'd like to be prayed for this morning any form of healing if you're not already here at these altars please come forward right now I'm gonna ask our prayer team to respond and let's pray and anoint with oil in the name of the Lord, as the scripture says, and the sick person will be made well. It's nothing, it's nothing about the oil that's powerful. It's about the obedience to the word of God that creates the power. So we're gonna pray for those enduring your season of waiting. We haven't forgotten you, but God is moving. There's a healing and anointing this morning, and Jesus wants to touch bodies. He wants to touch minds. I I feel like there's somebody considering, should I even stand in proxy or in faith for someone who's not here? Yes, come and stand for them in faith. If you're believing God for healing for someone who's not here, we're gonna pray for them as well because we're gonna recognize what God is doing in this moment. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you, oh God. Prayer team, begin to minister. Lord, we thank you, Jesus 
for the faithfulness of your presence, oh God. So many, Lord, in this room and possibly online as well have been in a season of waiting for healing, oh God, for healing and deliverance from something, Lord Jesus. And God, I thank you that you are a God who works in the waiting, but you don't only work in the waiting. You are the God of the now as well. God, when you choose a Kairos moment, Lord Jesus, to move, oh God, we want to recognize those moments. And so, God, I believe that this is a Kairos moment for some to receive their healing from you, Lord Jesus. And so, God, we pray as the believers in Acts did, Lord, stretch forth your hand and heal, Lord Jesus. Show your power and your glory for the honor and praise of your name alone. Hallelujah.